The topic for this afternoon is really to um, understand there's been a great deal going on in terms of immigration enforcement and detention over um, the, the, a long period of time, but we want to focus particularly on changes. What's developed? What's new? What's going on? And this is a, a perfect time for this panel to get together because we have a new report out from the Department of Homeland Security. And um, I also want to thank two of my colleagues on the stage for coming in and um, taking uh, responsibility to help our audience understand these issues better because we've had two cancellations at the last minute. Chief Huffman from the Border Patrol had a family emergency, a very understandable, um, happened on Thursday. And um, Dr. Rosenblum has taken his, his the, the place of talking about Border Patrol issues. And fortunately, I asked Mark to do a report as quickly as he could on this and you know lo and behold there it is um, and you'll be hearing about that mark's extraordinary and we're very lucky to have him here and we're also very very pleased to have um, phil miller who's the deputy director at and let me tell you the the exact name of the office just so you because it changes over time as phil was reminding us before enforcement and removal operations at u.s immigration and customs enforcement um, and and his, um, his the director of ERO had to fly out today someplace a last another last minute change so we're very grateful Phil for you stepping in for that and our um, Cecilia Wong who's been on this panel from the beginning thank you so much Cecilia <laughs> and for I'm coming down <laughs> and for not needing a substitute I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> The ACLU has, has long been involved in some very important issues in, in, our, in immigration enforcement, and uh, Cecilia is the deputy legal director there, so we're delighted to have her as well. You have their full bios. I'm one who does not do more than a very basic introduction of our panelists because you can learn the, the details. They're all experts. They all have been involved for many years on these issues, and I'm delighted that they've joined us. So I thought we'd start with some of the background here, particularly on the border. Um, so Dr. Rosenblum is going to talk about his new report, and he's got a PowerPoint. From, so Mark, Thank it's you. all yours. I'm going to stand up and do the PowerPoint from over here. Absolutely. <coughs> Feel free to talk from the panel or from up there. That's all fine. <coughs> OK. Um, <coughs> Thank you, Andy, and uh, thank you for uh, letting me come join you all today. I'm excited to be back at, at this conference, and uh, I was especially pleased to be invited to join this panel because of this new report, which I think, uh, which we published about uh, two weeks ago, so I put it out very quickly when you asked, um, <laughs> negative two weeks. Um, I think the report represents a big step forward for the department. It's the first time that DHS is releasing details on some of the work that we are doing to uh, estimate the number of uh, migrants who succeed in unlawfully crossing the border. Um, so the report uh, focuses mostly on 2000 through 2016, and I'll also give a few statistics on what we know about 2017 apprehensions. Um, so all of the uh, all of the information I'm going to give you about sort of our uh, th these new data come from uh, this report. DHS estimates of DHS efforts to estimate Southwest border security between ports of entry. Uh, you can Google it. Um, I'm going to be describing sort of very current work that we're doing. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of this is work in progress that we're still figuring out exactly, you know, exactly how to, how to nail down the methodology, but, but uh, you know, far enough along for me to talk about it. Uh, so to state the obvious, it's hard to estimate how many people unlawfully cross the border because the border is highly complex and because some illegal border crossers seek to evade detection and some of them succeed. So uh, that's a fundamental challenge. As a result, any measure of illegal crossings or of enforcement success rates must rely on some type of estimate. Um, I am personally skeptical that we will ever come up with a single number that comprehensively and reliably just gives you a score and tells you everything <laughs> you, need to, you need to know about border security. Uh, but what we do in this report is to describe a somewhat, you know, a fairly broad array of indicators uh, that we can look at together to reach some, um, some, some conclusions about what we know about the overall state of border security and trends in border security. And the bottom line, uh, these data suggest that it is harder today to cross the border than has ever been the case before. And it is almost certainly the case that fewer people succeeded in crossing the border without being apprehended 
in 2015 and in 2016 than since about 1970. Um, so uh, those are, those are uh, big, impressive numbers. <clears throat> what we do in this report, uh, we divide uh, um, our efforts to measure border security into two broad approaches. Um, the first set of, of indicators uh, are enforcement outputs. Enforcement outputs refer to uh, uh, or try to describe how difficult is it for immigrants to cross the border illegally. Um, and we look at three separate um, output indicators. Uh, the first is the apprehension rate or the interdiction rate. <clears throat> and uh, this measure, you know, when we're talking about an apprehension rate or an interdiction rate, the question is what share of intending border crossers, of people who try to cross the border, what share of them are apprehended or interdicted? Uh, this is a very intuitive measure of how hard is it to cross the border, uh, and it's an appealing measure because if we had a 100% apprehension rate, then zero people would succeed in crossing the border. So people are, you know, this, this is a measure we're interested in. Um, and it would be easy to calculate the apprehension rate if we, um, if we could observe every inch of the border 24 hours a day because we would just divide the number of apprehensions, which we know, by the number of people trying to cross the border, and, and that would give us a, you know, an, apprehen an apprehension rate. But of course, we don't have perfect information about how many people are trying, so that's why we have to rely on estimates. Um, I can talk about uh, the methodology for how we're doing these new calculations, and I can talk about the nuanced differences between these three different measures uh, that I'm showing you here in this picture. Um, what I want to show, what I just want to, I'm going to just go through some results without talking about methodology. We can get into that in Q&A if people want. The bottom line in this figure is that um, these three measures have increased from uh, low points of between 33 and 70 percent in the middle of the last decade to between 55 and 83 percent last year. So all three of them show pretty clear upward trends over the last decade or so. Um, that's what we know about apprehension and, and interdiction rates. Um, the second output measure that I want to describe is the deterrence rate. And this is the estimated share of migrants who, following a failed unlawful entry attempt, are deterred from making a subsequent reentry attempt and decide instead to return home or otherwise remain in Mexico. Um, so one way we might try to measure uh, um, uh, deterrence is through Border Patrol data on recidivism. How many people does Border Patrol catch again after they are deported? Um, the problem with Reapprehensions is that they depend partly on deterrence and partly on the apprehension rate, so it's not really a, you know, a measure of deterrence. Um, so the other way we try to measure deterrence is by asking deportees, do you plan to try again? Um, and uh, <laughs> I mean, not us asking, but, um, but, but a number of academic surveys. That most notably, there's a survey uh, conducted by the Colegio de la Frontera Norte, uh, a, well, you know, a, a good university in Mexico that's been doing, asking people that question since 1993, um, that's what that long blue line is, is their data on do you plan to try again. Um, you know, a problem with that survey data is that people may misrepresent their answers. They may strategically not want to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to try again because, you know, they think that that's going to get them in trouble. Or they may say, no, I, I, I do plan to try again, but once they actually undertake the effort, you know, they may give up in the face of persistent enforcement. So it's just not a, you know, that survey data is not a perfectly reliable indicator of deterrence. It's, it's the best that we have. Um, so having said it's not perfectly reliable, you can see that, um, that what the survey data show is that um, as many as 80 or 90 percent of deportees back in the 90s and early 2000s intended to try again. That number is very consistent with what academic, you know, sort of small in survey research has found. Uh, it's very consistent with what Border Patrol agents will tell you. Uh, for a long time, the conventional wisdom was that we had a revolving door mat, uh, model of enforcement. You know, deportees just came back the next day. Uh, but the survey data and, and anecdotal uh, stories tell us that that model has really changed in the last decade. And now uh, as many as 60 percent of people don't try again after being uh, deported. So um, that's a very different picture. Um, I think one of the most important uh, points I want to communicate today um, is, is this figure. I love this figure. Um, so uh, Congress and, and many others, we've been very focused on the apprehension rate, but what I want to show you with this figure is that deterrence is essentially equally important in explaining overall enforcement outcomes on the border. Uh, and the reason is essentially because of that revolving door mo model uh, that I just described. So this figure shows you 
the percentage of people who succeed uh, uh, after one or more attempts at crossing the border as a function of both what share get apprehended and what share get deterred. So uh, the area below the shaded line shows you um, the conditions under which a majority of people eventually succeed in, in entering the US. Uh, so even if the apprehension rate is 80 or 90 percent, if only 10 or 20 percent are deterred, then we're still solidly in that red space. And you know the vast majority of people eventually succeed after one or more attempts. And what the data that I just showed you on the last couple of slides show is that we've made um, some modest but significant progress in the last couple of decades in moving up this figure and some much more significant progress in moving to the right on this figure. So, you know, getting more into the, you know, the yellow and the white areas where uh, most people don't eventually succeed. <coughs> so the third um, sort of output measure I want to show you is border crossing costs. And what I'm talking about here is uh, two, two sort of ideas, the share of migrants who hire a smuggler and the average fees that smugglers charge. So, so how much do people pay to, to get uh, to cross the border? Again, we rely essentially on survey data, either academic surveys or Border Patrol custodial interviews, which is you know, essentially a survey. Um, and uh, this figure is showing you inflation-adjusted dollars, so you know, controlling for inflation. Bottom line is that uh, it's gone from about $300 that people pay smugglers in 1981 to about $4,000 in 2015. And actually, the latest custodial data from, from Border Patrol is that the number's quite a bit higher in 2016 and 2017. So it's getting much more expensive. Um, that figure understates how much more expensive it's getting because it used to be the case that smugglers provided an unlimited number of attempts for a flat rate, and now they provide one to three attempts. So, so you know, this understates the real increase. And it understates the real increase because previously, about uh, back, in the, in the, in, back in the day, about half of, of intending border crossers hired a smuggler. And what the survey data show now is that over 95% hire a smuggler. So everybody hires a smuggler, they pay a lot more, and they get less, you know, fewer tries for the service. So this is a, a significant change. Um, so these numbers, you know, these border crossing costs, uh, they're important to think about for a couple of reasons. One is that um, they're an important indicator of how difficult it is to cross because, uh, you know, prices in illicit markets are pretty efficient indicators of the value of the service. You know, the smugglers will only charge what the market will bear. People will only pay what the market will bear. We also have a lot of evidence that smugglers are being forced to raise their rates um, because they have to pour a lot more resources into getting people across the border. It used to be that, you know, you had these small mom and pop organizations, one guy guiding, you know, two or three dozen immigrants just, you know, through the desert. Uh, pretty informally, now you have these sophisticated networks of spotters and safe houses and guides, uh, a team of people guiding a small number of immigrants. It's a much more expensive operation, uh, and, and that drives the prices up. Um, but the second reason that these border crossing costs are so important is that um, uh, it seems to be the case that these uh, prices are, uh, that these increasing co crossing costs are pricing a larger number of immigrants out of the market. Um, so uh, this dynamic may be actually the primary driver of the, the, the shrinking number of people uh, crossing the border. Um, if fewer people can hire a smuggler, the number of crossing attempts goes down and the number of successful illegal entries goes down much faster than the gains in the apprehension rate alone would suggest. So this is a huge driver of, you know, the, the changing story of what we're seeing on the border. Um, so then. I've talked about how hard is it to cross the border. You know, the bottom line number that, that we should care about is how many people are crossing the border. So these are enforcement outcomes. How many people succeed in crossing the border illegally uh, between ports of entry? Um, and uh, again, um, we've got several specific metrics that, I, that we talk about in the report. I can say more about the details, but I'm gonna just sort of tell you the bottom line number. Our best guess is that successful illegal entries, and I'm describing the green line, which we only have data going back to 2000, uh, our best guess is that s successful illegal entries uh, fell about 91% between 2000 and 2016, from about 1.8 million people to about 170,000 people. So 91% decrease in the number of people crossing the border. And given what we know about the long-term trend in apprehensions, uh, and what we know about the trend in apprehension rate, uh, it's almost certainly the case that the fewest number of people successfully crossed the border in 2015 and 2016 
since about 1970, maybe a little bit earlier than that, so about 50 years. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, these are very encouraging numbers in terms of what we know about border security uh, going back um, 2000 through 2016 and really over the last 50 years. Um, so finally, let me quickly uh, show you some preliminary numbers. These are unofficial numbers uh, for what we know about uh, the 2017 apprehensions. Um, bottom line here, the numbers have continued to fall. Um, we're on pace for about a 25% overall reduction compared to last year based on the first 11 months of unofficial data. Uh, about a, an 8% decrease from 2015, which was previously the, the low point for the last 50 years. Um, Mexico is on pace for a 34% reduction from last year. So, you know, a lot of the decrease in, in apprehensions, a lot of the decrease in successful legal entries has been driven by the Mexican numbers falling very sharply, and that continues and it, and it has accelerated in the last year. Um, more than a third of apprehensions so far in 2017 have been non-Mexican children and families, the, the UACs and the, the family units. Um, so, um, uh, you know, two, two things that that suggests. One, very few of these family units and children succeed in evading detection. So based on that 2017 trend, it is almost certainly the case that we will see uh, a further significant drop in our estimate of illegal entries for 2017. We'll, we'll see again a lower number than, than the last two years, which were record lows. Um, and it reinforces uh, what we know about the trend over the last several years. The primary challenge at the border, you know, is not the traditional challenge of single Mexican adults looking for jobs. The, the, the increasingly, the, the primary issues are non-Mexicans and especially these families and children. And it's really a population that our current enforcement strategies and, and, and infrastructure weren't really designed to address. <laughs> Um, so I will stop there, I think, about 10 minutes. Perfect, Mark. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, so we'll now shift to interior enforcement and to learn more about the developments in that area, uh, we'll hear from Deputy Director Miller. Thanks, Andy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, following on from uh, Mark's presentation for the, the population that either makes it past uh, CBP at the border or subsequent to their lawful entry commits a crime or violates their status in some other way, um, they are subject to interior enforcement and the branch of DHS that primarily is involved with civil immigration enforcement in the interior is in fact ERO. Although we, we have somewhat of a bifurcated mission in that we are the detention authority for the department. So in other words, whether it's CBP, <coughs> ICE, or in some instances the Coast Guard that makes the apprehension. Um, ERO is always the custodian of the person who is, is placed in the department's detention. But in terms of our enforcement, I just wanted to cover a few topics. I'm sure um, I probably don't have to cover any of these topics. I'm sure they're topics that not only are salient, but are um, you're well acquainted with most of them. But I wanted to um, just touch on these and maybe um, spur further conversation or, or questions as, as we go forward. Um, changes in our ERO priorities and policies. Um, the most noticeable change was the discontinuation of the priority enforcement program and um, a shift where we've been asked to fully enforce all of the statutes under the INA. So if you remember under PEP, um, there were limits on who we would take civil and immigration enforcement action against. And what that resulted in is a population of persons who either were in the country um, without a lawful status prior to January 1st of 2014 or um, they had had some kind of s encounter with us and been issued an order of removal that predated um, January 1st of 2020, January 1st of 2014. So we were precluded by policy from taking an enforcement action against them. Um, that policy is no longer in place. So as a result, um, when we come in contact with someone, um, primarily most of folks are encountered through the criminal alien program. Um, that remains today about 40% of all of the ICE arrests are through are through the criminal alien program. Um, that results in, um, those encounters result in us looking at across the full INA and taking whatever enforcement action is appropriate based on the sp um, specific facts of the individual. Um, part of growing that program has been the expansion of the 287G program. The 287G program is a, a designed to enhance our ability to screen persons in either county jails or state prisons. Um, th this allows ERO to, to focus its efforts, not necessarily in areas where either we don't have large enough staff 
or in uh, such a large geographic area by having these 287G programs, we're able to deploy our staff to other um, parts of that, of that AOR or area of responsibility. For instance, when I was the field office director in New Orleans, I had 21 offices in five states, but those 21 offices couldn't nearly cover 330,000 square miles effectively. I had 395 counties, a total of 495 um, either county jails or state prisons within that, those five states. As a result, having programs like 287G allowed me to strategically use my officers in tandem with the designated immigration officers um, from either a state or a county. Um, the program does remain under close overs oversight. Um, the designated immigration officers don't act in a val vacuum. They're required to complete all of the same annual training that an ICE officer is required to do, as well as being required to follow all of the policies and procedures that my officers would in processing someone who's encountered through a county jail or state prison. Um, the, the programs are subject to, to ICE management oversight and um, are in our constant evaluation on whether or not we should continue the program or not. Um, an area I'm sure that is um, of great concern to the group is um, the existence of the sensitive location policy. The sensitive location policy has been in place since 2011 has, and has not changed. Um, these include schools, hospitals, places of worship, funeral weddings or other religious ceremonies, <coughs> and sites of public demonstrations or rallies. Um, that does not include courthouses, which we'll talk about here a little later. Um, so what does that mean for communities that either choose to work with ICE or choose not to work with ICE? Um, and depending where you go in the country, we experience both. Um, the fundamental ask of our program is that when we identify an alien who is um, demonstrated through a probable cause assessment that they're amenable to immigration proceedings, that the, that the person holding this individual notifies us up to 48 hours before that, in, that man or woman is released from their custody. Um, some places are doing that, some are not. Um, additionally, we ask them to hold for up to 48 hours after the criminal detention for an orderly transfer. Very few jurisdictions um, do that currently. Um, and you know that's an individual decision that really at the county level, the sheriff or his private counsel, they're making independent decisions. And depending where you go in the country, there are some ruling, um, there are some ruling court decisions, either state court or federal court. And um, but some jurisdictions continue to work with us. Um, that's specifically in relation to immigration detainers. Um, what does that leave for the jurisdictions that won't work with us? Um, that pretty much means that all of that ERO does has to be done in the street. Um, not very safe for my officers, not the most efficient way to utilize our resources, but in jurisdictions that will not work with us, um, we're left with no other choice. I mean, we're sworn law enforcement officers. We have um, probable cause that a <coughs> crime's been committed. You know, we work in a strange world where the violator is also the violation, which um, is complex to say the least. But as a result, we, um, we find ourselves doing increased at large operations in a number of these jurisdictions. Um, that includes courthouse arrests. People say, why do we go to courthouses? Um, two reasons. First of all, courthouses tend to have people who have been um, arrested or convicted of crimes. Second of all, um, the safest way for my officers to operate is on the safe side of a magnetometer. When you go through a courthouse, much like going through um, any other controlled environment, you're screened for weapons. Much safer for my officers to operate on the good side of a magnetometer than in a street, in a car, in someone's apartment. Um, for those jurisdictions that choose not to work with us, either at the jail or at the courthouse, um, and <coughs> we have to work, you know, do our job on the bad side of the magnetometer or out on the streets, we won't shy from that responsibility, but it certainly isn't the most efficient. And that also, um, you know, people talk a lot about why do we do collateral arrests. When you drive us to a house, you drive us to an apartment, for reasons of officer safety, if I go to your place and you allow me in, and my officers are there, they need to make sure the entire environment is safe. So we're gonna interview everybody in there, um, sometimes biometrically, sometimes biographically. But when we encounter someone who may not be the target of our enforcement operation, but is nevertheless in violation of the law, the executive orders um, direct us to take those people into custody as well. So you know, ideally, if a community was working with us and we were doing the criminal alien program, which is our most desired outcome, in a jail, safe for my officer, um, safe for the community, those collateral encounters wouldn't take be taking place. So um, in a nutshell, that's where we're at today. And I will now pass to Cecilia. Thanks so much, Phil. Appreciate it. Uh, and yes, the um, ACLU has long been involved in immigration enforcement issues. So 
Cecilia, th thank help you. us understand what's going on. Thank you, Andy. Um, I, I really appreciate being on this panel with, with all three of you, um, and particularly with Phil Miller and Mark Rosen Rosenblum uh, being with um, the government agencies. Um, I, thought I just reflected, before I get into what I prepared to talk about today, um, while both Mark and Phil were speaking, I reflected on the fact that this conference is unique because it brings together people from the advocacy world, from government, from law enforcement, um, people who approach uh, these issues from a scholarly lens, from a data-driven lens, from a law enforcement lens. And I'm about to speak from a legal and constitutional rights lens. But I wanted to pause for a minute and reflect on a human view of what we're talking about during this panel. Um, because it really struck me when Mark talked about his methodologies going into this statistical study um, and trying to determine what the effective deterrence rate is of U.S. border enforcement policies that we can talk about it in terms of interviews that Border Patrol agents do with individuals who are apprehended. Um, but I've seen that with my own eyes and heard it with my own eyes um, when I went several years ago to observe Operation Streamline presentments in Tucson and, um, and Zuma. Um, I saw it myself when I was a federal public defender in the Southern District of New York. And I'm reflecting on the fact that I saw person after person stand before a U.S. magistrate judge and plead guilty to illegal entry under 8 U.S.C. 1325 or 8 U.S.C. 1326. And the magistrate judge would say, uh, you know, tell me what you did in your own words. And man after man, and they were all men uh, in the cases that I saw, said, I understood the penalties. I understood the criminal penalties. I understood that I may go to a federal prison for coming back into the United States illegally. But my whole family is here. All my children are US citizens. And I'm just going to keep coming back. And I'm reminded of Pablo Alvarado, the director of the National Day Labor Organizing Network, who once said at a conference very much like this one at Stanford Law School, as a father, as an immigrant, I would cross any number of borders and take any number of risks to my personal safety for love for my children. And so I just wanted to frame up um, what we're talking about here in those very human terms. So, you know, the, as, as Andy pointed out, <coughs> um, the ACLU is nonpartisan. Uh, we w went after many Obama. We met, went after many Obama administration policies very hard. One example I would give is uh, the Obama administration's treatment of women and children, asylum seekers from Central America, from the Northern Triangle where President Obama, Vice President Biden, uh, and then Secretary Johnson all said categorically, if you're coming here from uh, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, you're not eligible for asylum. We will detain you, and we will deport you expeditiously. And we're saying this for your safety to deter you and others from coming to the United States to apply for asylum. Now. From, from, the, from a civil rights perspective and from an international human rights perspective, that was outrageous, right? Because it violates international human rights law, it violates US statutes, uh, and violates due process for people who are coming here who have a right to be screened for, uh, for protection claims. Um, but I do want to start by saying that the current administration, um, and I say this from a nonpartisan perspective, uh, really presents some unique and, I would say, unprecedented threats to our constitutional rights here in the United States. And because of some of the enforcement tactics um, that Phil discussed that have come directly from the President's executive orders of January 25th, um, I, would, I would maintain that those are dragnet enforcement tactics and strategies that will have a very significant carryover effect to U.S. citizens and to non-citizens who are lawfully present in the United States. So I thought I would um, kind of tick through a few of these examples of areas where 
um, I would characterize current policy as casting a dragnet that really imperils our constitutional rights and some of our values. Um, I'd start out by saying that I, I think one of the reasons that the Trump administration uh, really poses unprecedented threats, both in scope, number, and severity in terms of immigration enforcement, <coughs> is of course that the president, first as a candidate, but continuing since he's taken office, has made a number of statements that ground his immigration policy uh, explicitly in uh, an anti-religion uh, bias or in an anti-nationality uh, bias. And I dare say that makes um, the job of some of my co-panelists much more difficult. Right? When you had the President of the United States as a candidate saying, and I quote, when Mexico is sending people, they're not sending their best, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some I assume are good people. And then, uh, not to leave uh, Muslims uh, uh, un unaddressed, you know, he, it's very well known to everyone in the room, declared there's great hatred toward Americans by large segments of the Muslim population. Muslim immigrants represent an extraordinary influx of hatred and danger coming to our country. Islam hates us. He called for a shutdown of Muslims entering the United States um, and said that one of his uh, priorities as a policy is preventing Muslim immigration to the United States. So that's the backdrop. Um, and that's the explicit, uh, one of the explicit underpinnings for the Trump administration's immigration policies. And from that underpinning flows a lot of consequences. Um, both in terms of the politics of how Americans view this administration and its policies, and it has a lot of consequences for how courts will address challenges to these policies that are brought by the ACLU and, and others. Um, so the first example I'd go to, um, sticking with the border theme, is the Trump administration's uh, treatment of electronic devices at ports of entry, right? Um, you know, the federal government, regardless of who's in the White House, has long maintained uh, exceedingly broad ability to uh, search uh, people and, and question people at ports of entry or at the border. Um, but on this front, the Trump administration has uh, appeared to seriously step up searches and seizures of electronic, de electronic devices um, at ports of entry. And what we've seen is that uh, these 2009 directives by both CBP and ICE seem to be deployed um, in a much more concerted way um, and in ways that have uh, led people to call uh, the administration out for potentially discriminating against people uh, who are Muslim or who are assumed to be Muslim. Um, the other danger that I think we face from a civil liberties perspective on this subject is that um, it does appear that the government is using much more invasive forensic tools to carry out searches of electronic devices at ports of entry. Um, and this includes not only non-citizens, but U.S. citizens who are re-entering the United States after a trip abroad. So what are the consequences of this? As you see the Trump administration um, and I'm sure Phil will correct me uh, if, if, if he disagrees, but if, if the Trump administration is ramping up <coughs> its searches and seizures of people's laptops and cell phones coming into the United States from a trip abroad for work uh, or for, for, for vacation, uh, I, I would guess that we're gonna see a backlash to this. Um, I should mention the ACLU brought a lawsuit just uh, you know, a couple weeks ago on September 13th, Al-Assad versus Duke, um, to challenge this very practice. Um, and, you know, there are serious constitutional issues. We would maintain that under the Supreme Court's decision in Riley uh, versus California, that those searches of electronic devices without probable cause uh, to believe that a crime has com been committed or that some violation of civil immigration or customs laws uh, has been committed does violate the Fourth Amendment. Um, on the interior enforcement front, I'll throw out a couple of other examples of what I would 
call uh, a dragnet approach to immigration enforcement that has much broader consequences. Um, we know all, all know very well that the Trump administration, President Trump himself, uh, has rescinded the DACA program um, with a phase-out uh, period. Even before that rescission happened, um, the Trump administration had um, engaged, carried out some prominent arrests, very high-profile arrests, of people who had DACA uh, or had previously had deferred action under the DACA program. Um, and there was a perception as a re result of that enforcement tactic that we had not seen under the previous administration that, number one, there were retaliatory arrests. Uh, that is, there were cases like uh, the case of Daniela Vargas, um, the dreamer in Mississippi, who spoke at a rally against Trump administration immigration policies and then was arrested shortly thereafter. Um, we also saw a few other high-profile arrests of, uh, of um, people who had DACA um, deferred action, uh, including ACLU client Jessica Colodal uh, in, in Georgia. Within the first two weeks of the inauguration, in fact, we saw that one weekend where there appeared to be a very large number of so-called ICE raids, what, what the community, uh, people in various communities around the country call raids, where there are very high visibility um, operations by ICE in Los Angeles, Chicago, Atlanta, San Antonio, New York City, Austin, very prominently. Um, and <clears throat> the Trump administration had said, we are going after people with criminal convictions. But then uh, at least the ICE field director in Los Angeles admitted that uh, there were only a very small number of people who were arrested during that weekend of operations who had criminal convictions and uh, most of those were mis for misdemeanors. We also saw, um, have seen this pattern uh, since the rescission of DACA um, of, you know, very high profile statements uh, by administration officials, uh, including the president himself, that um, I would really say uh, are meant to deploy a shock and awe strategy among immigrant communities in the United States. Um, after DACA was uh, recent, the announcement of DACA's rescission, uh, we saw documents coming from the Department of Homeland Security uh, stating that people who currently have DACA status better get their travel papers in order, right? Signaling you're, you're no longer safe from being arrested at any time. Um, we've also seen uh, very high profile moves with, uh, for example, the reversal of the federal government's approach toward uh, Iraqis who had very old removal orders. This, was, this came out in another ACLU case, uh, the Hamama case out of Michigan. So uh, there were a number of, of Iraqis in the country, about 1,500 who had old removal orders. Uh, they had been uh, at large in the community, uh, at liberty in the community, I should say, um, on bond or in supervision. And between uh, the first executive order implementing the Muslim ban to the second executive order implementing the Muslim ban, of course, Iraq had been removed from the list of banned countries. And part of the bargain that the federal government had struck um, was that uh, Iraqis uh, would now be removed back to Iraq. And the administration uh, took the position that they would suddenly go out and arrest Iraqis with very old orders and simply reinstate those orders and try to put people on a plane to Iraq. Well, needless to say, uh, many of those people with very old removal orders um, have protection claims, asylum claims. And there was uh, no process for people to raise their asylum claims um, as the government had rolled out um, its, its new strategy towards the Iraqis. So we went into court in order to um, obtain some an injunctive relief for these uh, Iraqis with old orders so that they could get some due process and get into court and make any claims for relief from removal. And 
I think that the, the district court order in the Hamama case was really notable because it echoes what we've seen from federal courts around the country, whether it's on the Muslim ban or on this issue of Iraqi removals or it's on uh, the uh, state and local efforts to challenge another aspect of the executive order I'm sure you'll hear about in the next panel, uh, which is the anti-sanctuary anti provisions of the Interior Enforcement Executive Order. Um, courts have really served as the bulwark to some of the, uh, these excesses of the current administration as it's rolling out its new policies and tactics um, as, as Phil just described them. And I, I think it's worth um, quoting from the preliminary injunction order in the Hamama case just to give you an example of how the courts see their role. <coughs> um, the district judge wrote in response to the, uh, the habeas petition, in these singular circumstances, a federal district court is armed with jurisdiction to act as a first responder to protect the writ of habeas corpus and the allied right of due process by allowing an orderly filing for relief with the immigration courts before deportation, thereby assuring that those who might be subjected to grave harm and possible death are not cast out of this country before having their day in court, right? And so we see the courts. We saw the same thing with all of the various cases, uh, the ones by, what brought by Washington State, by Hawaii, by our clients, uh, the International Refugee Assistance Program and HIAS. Um, who you heard from uh, in an earlier panel today. And so uh, I'm being told to wrap up, so I will. Uh, I, I just, I'll end by saying, you know, there were, there were many of the, the, the sort of uh, enforcement strategies that um, Phil just referred to that are a great concern to us. Um, the sensitive, targeting of sensitive locations um, has had enormous impact, not just on immigrants, not just on non-citizens, uh, but on others who are trying to seek access to petition the government, whether in civil cases, people seeking uh, restraining orders against domestic violence abusers, or a criminal defendant trying to defend himself against a criminal charge in state court. We just saw on social media in the last few days the case of a Latino U.S. citizen who was accosted uh, reportedly by a plainclothes ICE agent outside the Washington uh, county courthouse, Portland suburbs, as his wife uh, uh, was castigating this um, reported ICE agent, saying he's a U.S. citizen. What are you doing? Why are you, why are you bothering my husband? Um, I'll wrap up by saying that we've seen what 287G, the program for uh, conscripting, well, I guess in this case, uh, cooperating with local and, and state uh, agencies, um, has caused. We've seen what these policies entail. When you do street enforcement, as Phil described it, you cast a dragnet that catches people of color, regardless of their citizenship status, regardless of their immigration status. We, this is Joe Arpaio's tactic for doing immigration enforcement. And we have seen the result is rampant Fourth Amendment violations and rampant racial profiling. And so the question I would pose in, in, in all good faith, actually, to my, my co-panelists and to others in ICE is, how will you deal with those constitutional violations? How do you intend to do street enforcement, sensitive locations enforcement, without violating the rights of all people, whether they're undocumented immigrants, US citizens, or something in between? And I think that there's going to be a political backlash, just as we saw with Arizona, as well as a legal check on those government enforcement actions. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, Thank you. OK, if you can hold your applause until the end, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so um, you've heard some very different perspectives. And um, I'm going to, in a moment, after I give the panelists a chance to talk about some of the issues that arose. I'll then ask for some questions and answers from the audience. Um, so feel free soon to come down and, and line up with your questions. Please identify yourself so the panelists know who you are, where you work, et cetera, or where you study. Um, and uh, we'll proceed from there. But I did want to give the panelists, since we've heard, we've heard a you know, statistical report on changes at the border. 
that have provided new information about how secure the border is. Um, we've heard the developments that Phil has described in terms of what the new administration is doing with the discontinuation of the priorities enforcement, enforcing all the laws of the INA. Um, and we've heard from Cecilia some of the challenges that have been taking place for years and now are, are, are some new additional ones that are, are developing uh, as well. So I'll, I first want to ask the panelists if they have any comments they'd like to make at this point about things that have come up and then I'll turn to the audience. So anybody from the panel want to start us off? I'll just I'll make one uh, one quick observation, sort of in response to, to your comment and and, and reflecting. Um, uh, I'll um, I, I was thinking just now of a report uh, that I did with Doris Meisner when I was when I worked at, at MPI a few years ago that described the changing trends between interior and border enforcement that mm -hmm. took place between the 90s into you know through the Bush administration into the Obama administration and. You know, one of the, the big findings of that report is that, um, you know, broadly that uh, executive branch policies matter a lot and that we saw uh, over the course of, uh, you know, towards the end of the Bush administration through the early years of the Obama administration because of the expansion of 287G, because of the National Fugitive Operations Program, because of the development of secure communities, uh, a big shift um, that uh, a, an increasingly high share of of the total number of apprehensions and arrests took place in the interior, mm -hmm. you know, as those policies came online and as the number of, of border apprehensions fell uh, over the, the last, the second Obama term, uh, that 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 uh, balance shifted much more back to the border, you know, as, as PEP was stood up and, and as some of those um, Bush era programs were sort of rolled back. So, you know, what, you know, between what we're seeing at the border and, and you know, the, the you know, the, the policies that the, that the current administration has directed ICE to pursue, you know, uh, th there's, a, there's, there's huge changes in, in how immigration enforcement operates, you know, uh, potentially checked by the courts and, and by, you know, Cecilia and others' work. But, um, you know, this stuff is, is definitely uh, very much in flux. Thanks, Mark. Phil? Yeah, I would, agree I would agree with what Mark said. And, you know, this is the fourth president that I've served, mm -hmm. served under in my career. And every time there's a new president, we're asked to do things completely differently. Um, <laughs> by completely different, we kind of swing from one extreme to another, which sadly is kind of how politics works in America. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, what that means for my officers is that um, they have to kind of relearn their jobs because um, they've been doing their job one way um, for eight years, and they do their job another way for eight years, and now we're doing our job a different way yet again. Um, and it doesn't matter, um, you know, the political party, the actual application of the INA is something that um, is is unique and when we're asked to do things differently um, there's a lag in terms of um, the best way to do that um, you know it, as Cecilia knows she very cleverly brought up three cases that I can't talk about because <laughs> <laughs> DOJ counsel is not present and since DOJ represents um, the government um, I have don't, no don't comment, comment on any of those um, so, which was I guess a, a great way to take those issues off the table so we don't um, talk a lot of time about you know pending litigation that will ultimately be decided by the courts and not by any of the learned persons here um, but you know what Mark said is true I mean everything old is new again with immigration enforcement I mean we were asked to do things I mean the information the biometric information sharing that started under one administration never stopped during uh, under another that actually is something that came out of 9-11 the 9-11 Commission that the federal government had to do a better job about sharing information that it had about you know people who either pose a public safety or national security threat and um, you know I mean at the end of the day you know I'm a cop I'm a police manager now because I work in DC and I'm not you know on the streets of New Orleans but um, at the end of the day you know I'm a cop and I'm trying to make a positive impact in my community the officers that work for me live in the communities that they're policing you may not like the laws that we're enforcing but you know people in another part of the city pass the laws you know and you know I would just ask that um, you know while you may advocate or while you may um, petition people on the hill um, you know let's do so in a respectful way like threatening my officers threatening my superiors um, taking um, you know physical action um, against my officers um, 
is probably not the way that there's actually going to be meaningful di um, dialogue about immigration enforcement in America, nor is it a way that um, the INA is ever going to change or evolve. I mean, it's, it's actually odd to me, you know, I mean, we, Andy and I joked about, you know, what this part of immigration enforcement has been called, and it's been called four different things since I've been around, and it's probably been called other things um, before me, and it'll be called other things after me, but it's th the nature of they keep changing the ask of my officers, they keep changing what we're called. I mean, when Doris was our commissioner, we were DDMP, then DNR, then DRO, and so, um, you know, I mean, in now we're ERO, um, and that's because we're being asked to do things differently with a different focus. Um, so um, while, you know, I'm happy to talk about, you know, where we're going and why, just um, remind, you know, I, I would ask that we do so in a civil way. Absolutely. So, um, any other comments? Uh, please start coming up to the po uh, the microphones, and um, we'll start taking questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, there seem to be a few questions that were raised. <laughs> well done, panel. Okay. Outstanding. And we'll st we'll start on this side, and we'll we'll alternate. Uh, hi, Try to be concise. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Allie McCracken, and I'm with Amnesty International. Uh, recent complaints and reports have raised concerns about whether CBP officials are following proper procedures involving asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, in several cases, it's been reported that officers are turning people away point blank um, or coercing them into withdrawing their credible fear assertions. Uh, in some reports, uh, we've heard that people are being told that things are different under Trump. Uh, so at Amnesty International, we're very concerned uh, because these allegations constitute a violation of international law and domestic law. So my question is for Mr. Rosenblum. Uh, in your research, have you come across this form, this unlawful form of deterrence? And can you shed any light on um, if DHS is investigating these claims? Thank you. Um, unfortunately, you know, I'm really not the operational person. I have not, I have not found that in my research. I've seen some media. I've seen some of uh, Amnesty's work uh, and, and or media reports on it, but um, I don't really know. I, I can't really help you. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, the gentleman from CBP couldn't be with us here today. I mean, I can just tell you in terms of, um, you know, the persons, the detainees we receive from CBP or the people who um, are not appropriate for detention, so they're put on alternatives to detention coming from CBP, they continue to file defensive asylum applications. So, I mean, I, I'm sure if CIS was sitting on the panel, they would be able to, more than happy to tell you about the increase in the number of asylum applications. And if EOIR was here, they could speak with greater fidelity to the number of defensive asylum applications. Um, but, uh, I mean, anecdotally from what we're seeing in the field, there's been no um, decrease in the number of defensive asylum applications resulting subsequent to a CBP encounter or interdiction. And I can confirm th those data trends that we're certainly still seeing a lot of asylum applications. Of course, the challenge with that data is the, the part that we can't count. Right. Oh, sure. That we, mean, we don't know. And yeah, uh, all we know is when they come to detention. Exactly. So it, that is the trend for sure, that it's, it's, <laughs> it's up. Um, but we don't know what's happening at the border. I'm sorry that Chief Huffman couldn't be here. I mean, he's sorry, too. I, I know. Thank you. Yes. Mary Small, Detention Watch Network. My question is for Mr. Miller. Uh, as Congress is uh, in negotiations about the amount of funding that ICE will have available in FY18, uh, it's my understanding that in addition to an expansion of detention that uh, ICE is telling congressional appropriators that your costs per bed uh, per day are actually increasing. Uh, this is confusing to us because everything that we can see would indicate that detention is actually becoming cheaper from new IGSA detention contracts coming online with very low per diem, some as low as $30 a day, to um, more fluidity in transfers of folks being who are going to be held long term being transferred to the south, to plans to roll back detention standards in a good chunk of detention facilities. Uh, and so given all of that, it's confusing that ICE would be saying that detention costs are going up. And, and back to what you said, that what's old is new again. Detention is one place where that's not true. We're not swinging back to another era. Detention has just been on an increasing line up. And if you actually cut detention 60 percent, you'd be back down to what it was under President Bush post 9-11. So it'd be helpful to hear um, input from you about why ICE is saying detention costs are going up. I would love to know where those $30 beds are, because I, I would <laughs> love to use them. Tom Green County, Texas. OK, thanks. <laughs> um, the reason bed cost is going up is because we're committed to, to moving eight, up to 80 percent of our population to 2011 standards. 2011 standards generally require um, additional staffing requirements to meet those more stringent um, standards to include um, full pre-implementation and pre-monitoring. 
And um, most of our detention costs are passed through labor costs associated with the operation of the facility. So if you ask more of um, the county or the vendor in terms of um, resources for the detained population and for, um, for trained PREA persons to be working at the facility, those come um, in turn to us. Additionally, we see um, increased medical costs. I mean, medical costs writ large in this country are going up. It, since most of the specialized care or chronic care needs of the detained population occur outside of the facility at local community providers, when those community prices go up, so too do those pass-through costs to us go up. Um, as, you, as more of our population shifts um, from border enforcement, which are generally younger persons that are in generally fairly good health, to interior enforcement, where you have um, people who have been you know, involved in more at-risk lifestyles for a longer period of time, you have a lot of chronic care needs, and all of chronic care needs, whether they're in detention or outside of detention, are remarkably expensive. Um, in terms of going um, from over 72-hour and under 72-hour standards to over seven-day and under seven-day, um, that was a move to be more transparent with Congress on how um, our population generally works. Um, generally, we move our population to larger facilities that are um, co-located with EOIR and, in some cases, USCIS um, asylum screening folks. Um, those larger facilities are the ones that, generally speaking, are already on 2011 or new locations would be on the 2011 standard. Um, that is where the population stays on average for more than seven days. Um, the smaller populations that essentially where people are, are maybe placed to an initial encounter and then move to a larger facility that um, has more robust resources, those are generally stays of shorter than seven days. So the, the mindset behind that was um, really just to have um, our standards mirror what is actually happening with our detained population. Um, the appropriators asked that we not make that change at this time, so we haven't. Thank you, Phil. Professor. Uh, May I from Columbia. Um, sorry to keep you on the hot seat, Mr. Miller. That's okay. I live there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Even when I go home, my kids have it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question has to do with um, expedited removal in the interior. Mm -hmm. um, so I have two questions for you. One is, um, since we know that the vast majority of uh, undocumented who live in the interior uh, have been here for more than two years. In fact, I don't know the number, but a, s a strikingly large proportion have been here 10 years. Sure. So I'd like to know the policy justification for an expedited removal in the interior since there are so few people proportionately in that situation. Um, and my second, the second part of my question has to do with enforcement and how you uh, intend to, uh, you know, what kind of due process there will be. So if, if an agent, an ICE agent confronts somebody and, and f for whatever reason believes that they are a, a target for expedited removal and the person says, I've been here for five years, what is the protocol for somebody being able to convince an ICE agent that they have been here for more than two years, one year, whatever it may be? I mean, I, I know many immigrants and ad advocates who are telling people to carry around their rent receipts utility bills, children's school, report cards. This is a lot to carry. <laughs> sure. You know, it's a lot of paper for someone to carry to show. And there, I, as far as I know, there are no um, rules that tell you what is accepted documentation. Um, and since there's no hearing before a judge, um, and it happens very quickly, the, the removal, um, I think this is a concern to many people about what kinds of um, uh, abuses might happen. So if you could speak to those points, I'd appreciate sure. it. Thank you. Did you guys file on this yet? <laughs> 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 you haven't issued the notice yet. <laughs> well said. Nice try, Phil. <laughs> no, um, I mean, my recommendation is to not do it in the interior. Um, I'm ultimately, that's a policy decision. I'm not a policy maker. I'm a policy implementer. So all I can do is, you know, based on, you know, having worked my entire career, I mean, Technically, New Orleans is a, is a port of entry, a seaport, but I mean, for immigration purposes, it's primarily can still considered interior enforcement. And having worked my whole career in interior enforcement, my recommendation is to not use the ER tool in the interior, but that policy decision will be made by someone other than myself. So would all you I can do is make the recommendation. Would you like to explain why? Um, I, I think that the most appropriate tool in the interior for much of what the professor said that um, although the burden of proof of, of showing when someone arrived is on the respondent in 212 proceedings, um, 
because that burden is on the respondent to, to have that conversation with the immigration judge, it's probably um, something that is better done before immigration court than um, done outside of that. Uh, I, I just think that, um, and believe me, I worked, when I was a special agent, I worked alien smuggling on the I-10 corridor mm -hmm. for six years, and I saw tons and tons of people being smuggled, but even those people, generally by the time they're leaving Houston and heading east on I-10, um, they've been in the country, you know, more than 14 days. Obviously, they're being encountered more than 100 air miles from the border. I think it's um, an appropriate and a, an important tool for CBP, but I, I think um, there are other tools available to us in the interior, um, you know, whether that's um, the NTA process, whether that's administrative removal for um, illegal aliens who've committed a felony. There are other administrative tools available to my officers, and I think that um, we should go forward with those. But that's, Thanks. you know... I, no one, you know, if anybody listens to me, <laughs> <laughs> this is a I'm very, guy. this is a very important conference, uh, Bill. There's no <laughs> question that people are listening to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Hi, my name is Jenny Doyle. I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina, and I practice immigration law largely in the humanitarian context. Most of my clients are women, they're children. In fact, they're the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. And my concern is around these collateral. Um, these co collateral contacts, particularly at the courthouses, and understanding what may be driving that, obviously, the executive order, but does, does ICE have numbers that you have to meet? For example, by October 30th, is there some sort of number that you have to, you have, to have attained or reported back to, um, to folks who are involved in business matrixing your operation? Could you, and if so, could you explain a little bit about how that works? Because I'm concerned that once some of the, um, some of the, some of the folks that you may be internalizing and prioritizing are complete, that my clients are going to be the next ones who, um, my, my highly vulnerable clients are going to be the next ones, the women, the children who have, um, who have, uh, who have matters pending are going to be the ones who are going to be um, running into contact with ICE. Uh, we don't have monthly matrix. That's only the state police with their ticket books. <laughs> um, no, I mean, first of all, collaterals are not allowed at courthouses. <laughs> courthouses are limited to targets. So um, if they're, you know, um, hopefully none of you are creating a narrative and telling your clients that, you know, if, I mean, most of the time, People know whether they're a convicted felon. People know whether they have a long history of domestic violence that would bring us to their door. Um, in terms of people going to family court and people uh, seeking other kinds of relief before a civil um, or an administrative law judge or a, s a state civil court judge, um, those are generally not the people that we're targeting. Um, you know, and collaterals are not allowed at courthouses. So, um, so that's the simple answer to that. And uh, what I would say is, um, you know, there's a number of programs through the Blue Campaign and other programs that are administered by HSI that if you think you have clients that qualify for T or U visas, you should be reaching out to the Victim Witness Coordinator within HSI and making sure your, your clients are, are completely aware of that. You know, we frequently get questions. In fact, I'll be going to IECP, the International Chiefs of Police um, Conference, coming up here next month. And especially in the police context, sheriffs understand our job a little more because ERO is more like a sheriff's department, a federal sheriff's department, than we are a federal police department. And police are always like, but now people won't come and talk to us if they're a victim. Well, I mean, our contacts are made through someone being booked into NCIC. That's the information sharing between the FBI and DHS. So, I mean, unless a, f a police department is fingerprinting their witnesses, unless a police department is fingerprinting their victims and transmitting that as an arrest packet to the FBI, we don't know who they're talking to. I mean, there's no way, I mean, the biometric transfer are for people who have either, um, you know, been, have been booked in on a criminal charge, a state criminal charge. I mean, a lot of localities now don't even submit fingerprints on municipal charges or county charges. It's only on federal charges. I mean, they affirmatively do that largely to save money. Uh, certain locations like Denver choose it to try to shield um, people from detection. And, um, but that is, you know, a separate conversation. But, you know, in terms of people who are at a courthouse for seeking some kind of administrative or civil relief, that you know are not there as a criminal defendant, um, you know we don't do collaterals at, at the courthouses. Good to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Bill. Yep. Yes. 
Hi, my name is Kristen Torres. I work at First Focus, a children's advocacy organization. And I have a question that's a little bit personal as well as professional, but um, as a wife of a Mexican immigrant who recently received his um, citizenship last year, I have definitely, personally, my family and I have felt the effects of, um, I think what MPI calls this muscular <laughs> um, rhetoric that the new administration has given um, in stereotyping those who come from the border as rapists and murderers and not the best. And um, recently my husband as well as his brother who's in the military were detained at the airport for nothing more than their names and the way that they look. Um, so for two hours, myself, a citizen, I was worried, had ACLU on, the <laughs> on my speed dial, um, you know, like, you know, and I, as something that I feel as a citizen, anyone should not have to deal with um, just based on um, kind of the certain climate. So my question is, I was just wondering, I know in the vein of all things old and becoming new again, but are there new uh, efforts that are going on to kind of combat some of this, like to combat some of the idea that um, anti-immigrant sentiments, um, the idea that all immigrants are villains and that all immigrants are here to steal your jobs. Is there any sort of training that's happening to deal with that? Well, um, again, we can't comment about CBP, so I'm sorry about your husband's experience. Um, you know, we have no control over what CBP does at a port of entry. Um, in terms of um, training people pro or con on rhetoric, um, you know, we train our officers as a matter of law. I mean, the Fourth Amendment training our officers um, receive is largely informed by what we've learned from my colleague. Um, through, <laughs> through litigation over time, and I mean, <laughs> but I mean, there's a, there's a big difference between um, a reasonable expectation of privacy in someone's home or vehicle, and um, you know, a casual encounter on the street. And our officers need to understand that difference and uh, conduct themselves appropriately. And um, you know, in terms of um, dealing with the rhetoric, I mean, we tell our you know our field managers you know, stick to the facts. You know, we're an industry or we're an agency that's driven on data and we're an industry that's driven on criminal contacts. As I said, we get the booking information from Department of Justice, we vet it through DHS indices, and we make individualized determination. If we have derogatory information, then it's appropriate to take an enforcement action. We don't, I mean, DHS has a lot of information, not all of which is derogatory. I mean, just as is, is all the good information that we have on people. It's an imperfect system, absolutely. I mean, there's sometimes there's, there's data lags, which is one of the things, I mean, we don't want to go down the whole road of, of better data integration within the department, <laughs> but Mark <laughs> talks all day about the efforts that, that he and I are doing so that, <laughs> it, along with our colleagues at CIS, so there's better access across the department. So when people, like your husband who has good information, in other words, you know, he's, he's naturalized or he had a lawful status, that, that's information that needs to be readily available to CBP at the time that, you know, he's applying for application, you know, he's making application for, for admission or, or readmission to the United States, much the same way that when we get a fingerprint packet for, for a booking packet on somebody, we need to be able to, to disqualify those people who have indicated that they're foreign born but have received a lawful benefit from, from the department. And so, you know, we try, Mark, that's a big effort that, that Mark and I are working on, and it's probably a multi-year effort to, to increase the availability of, of, of information so that the officers are making better decisions. I mean, in my day, to, to do a fingerprint check required hours of work, and now, you know, we're trying to get that down so people are making those, you know, getting that information that they can make a good, solid decision, a uh, you know, a decision that both protects people's rights and also enhances public safety in a matter of minutes and not hours. Because I started as an immigration inspector, and there were a lot of people who, who did have to wait a long time for that information transfer to happen, and that's when we were all DOJ. Think about, I mean, when we were all DOJ, it still took hours. Now we're doing it in minutes across the department. So, I mean, um, you know, I apologize for his experience on behalf of the department, but I would say that, you know, we continue to work on that effort because we know that the information needs to be available for our officers so they're making good decisions. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my, my name is Marcelo Rocha, and I'm a reporter with ProPublica. Um, I have one general and one, one specific question. The general one is if you can speak to morale at the agency over the past few years. I mean, we've experienced um, a lot of prosecutorial discretion, which literally means not enforcing the law, and I understand that's an interesting perspective for a law enforcement officer, and now we are doing enf enforcement of all the law, so I wanted to understand how that has shifted uh, the morale at the agency, and specifically, I wanted to follow up on the expedited removal front. Um, it was enlightening to hear that you 
as a matter of policy, don't think that expedited removal should be done in the interior, yet it's in the executive orders and the follow-up memos that it should be expanded to the interior. So I wanted to know if there were any specific plans about how that was going to be carried out. Yeah, uh, and that wasn't a, co a comment on policy. That was, you know, my view as a police manager and the recommendations right, right. that yeah, I've made. So, you know, I, I all I can do is make recommendations. I'm not a policy maker. And so, um, but in terms of morale, um, morale is, is up for our officers. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, nobody, um, you know, goes through training and puts their life on the line um, every day because they don't want to do their job. So, I mean, that's somewhat, you know, that's just the reality of, of the kind of people that we hire, the kind of people who choose to go into law enforcement. You know, most of our officers or many of our officers are veterans like myself that, you know, realize that, you know, you want to continue to serve the country. You know, I lived all over the world in the Army, and I've, I've worked all over the world with DOJ and DHS because I think that, you know, it's an opportunity to give back. You know, I mean, it's, um, you know, I've had, you know, wonderful life, but, it, you know, that protecting the ability for everybody here to have a good life comes at a cost. You know, I'm willing to bear my share of that, and all of, our, all of the people who work with me are willing to take on the same burden. But, you know, it, it comes with responsibility, and Cecilia makes sure that we're judicious in the exercise of our responsibility. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my question is for Mr. Mark Rosenblum. Uh, <laughs> about the <laughs> um, <laughs> with the data you presented, I was wondering if included in the failed attempts, if that referenced people who die in their attempt or just apprehensions. And I was wondering if you have any comments on some of the determinant being the risk of deaths, not just the risk of apprehension, and how we funnel immigrants and migrants into deathly situations. And also, I, w I heard that reports that the Arizona, Arizona State Coroner reports more deaths than CBP does. There's a significant difference. Um, in 2016, Arizona Coroner reported 127 deaths uh, and CBP only 110. And in 2015, they reported 143 and CBP only 68. So I was wondering if you had any comments on that. I'm going to pass that question to Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was very nice of her, Mark's though, my buddy. Not <laughs> on. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, so um, I'll take, uh, on, the, on the last part of your question, um, I, I don't have uh, sort of detailed insight into the methodologies, but I know that, you know, there are several different entities that, that estimate um, migrant deaths, and, you know, it's a, that's, that's also a complicated estimation process because you know it, it is inevitably based on finding remains that have to be dated and you know confirmed and and the coroners and CBP you know they have different methodologies and and I mean I don't I don't have details about why you know if CBP is systematically lower uh, I don't know if that's sort of biases in their methodology versus um, you know some other factor um, but but I know that you know those are sort of independent estimates with independent methodologies, so I'm not surprised that they produce somewhat different results. Um, to your other question about, um, I mean, this is th there is a long-term trend going back to the early '90s. You know, when when Border Patrol began moving more resources up to the line and and securing the easy to cross parts of the border. You know, beginning in in San Diego and El Paso. That was a strategy that, that involved making it harder to pass in sort of urban areas and accessible areas. And, and, um, and one of the you know, foreseen consequences of that is that people would be pushed out into more remote areas with the idea that that would deter people from crossing, but, but also put those who chose to do it at greater risk. So um, I mean, it is certainly the case that, that CBP and, and DHS have, have stood up programs to counter that. You know, there's the border star uh, part of CBP that is, you know, I think that's what they're called. Border it's it's specifically designed, to, you know, it's got a humanitarian mission. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I think inevitably um, CBP's effort to harden the border and to make it more <laughs> difficult to cross has pushed people into riskier crossing situations. And I mean, there's no question from looking at the data that the number of deaths of, of people trying to cross the border, we've seen a, a clear increase over the last two decades. I mean, it's sort of stabilized. It hasn't continued to exponentially increase. But, but many more people die trying to cross the border today than, than was the case before this policy was put in place. 
and many fewer people succeed in entering. I mean, it's, it, you know, uh, um, so I think that, that that is a, you know, an unintended consequence of the policy and a foreseeable consequence of the policy. So in your data, were, were you just referencing apprehensions or deaths in unsuccessful crossings? So we don't make an effort through this analysis that I was describing today to sort of independently um, count or estimate uh, border deaths. I mean, our, our estimate of, of successful illegal entries is built on, you know, the number of apprehensions divided by the odds of somebody, you know, ba based on our estimate of the apprehension rate, you know, uh, controlling for, for, for a few factors, but, but not trying to control for that. Thank you. So um, here's what we're going to do with our remaining five minutes. This is a challenge, but six <laughs> of you have been standing for a long time, so I want you to get to ask you to get your ask, and I want you to get to ask your questions. So this is an assignment for our panel. Mm -hmm. um, please listen carefully and maybe take some notes on the questions. But I have to limit you to 30 seconds each. Otherwise, we will not get through the questions. So please be really concise. We'll take some notes. And then the panel will answer questions, but also have a chance to wrap up with some concluding comments. Okay, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use my 30 seconds to introduce myself. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I was fortunate enough to go to Guatemala during the unaccompanied minors crisis during 2014. And one of the things that really surprised me that I learned was the number of people who were, being, the number of children who were being deported from Mexico to, you know, Central American countries. In the data that you, spoke about. I mean, what is happening right now with that a uh, partnership that the U.S. government had with Mexico where more people were deported from Mexico to Central American countries than from the U.S. border to Mexico? Thank you. I have to introduce myself. Please my, do. <laughs> my name is Heather. I'm a managing attorney with um, Catholic Charities of Baltimore Esperanza Center. Mm -hmm. We're a community center with a wide variety of services ranging from counter-trafficking case management legal services, a medical clinic. And my question for Mr. Miller regards um, the secure locations policy that you referenced earlier. And I understand That's the carve out for courthouses reviewing the policy and perhaps as I understood it, this administration is more, is trying to more strictly abide by the policy. But I wanted to ask you, the policy itself states that enforcement operations on the grounds of or near schools are covered by the policy. And in the Baltimore area, we have seen numerous enforcement operations right across the street from a school, if not on the curb of a school. And the same could be said of churches. Also in Montgomery County, we have seen similar things. So I just wanted to ask, what is ERO's position on the secure, um, uh, sensitive locations policy? Thank you. Anna Byers, I'm an Immigrant Justice Corps Fellow at South Yetu Center for African Women and Families. Um, my question is regarding a study put out by the uh, Black Alliance for Just Immigration and some of their partners uh, this winter, which showed that black immigrants are disproportionately targeted for enforcement and detention uh, and removal. And my question is what, if anything, the department is doing to try and avoid this kind of uh, racial profiling? Thank you. Hi, my name is Amaris Montes. I work with the Capital Area Immigrants Rights Coalition here in DC. Um, and so we serve all detained individuals in Maryland, Virginia, and um, DC area. And so my question is, um, so at, in the past couple months, we've seen a rise in um, minors who are, um, who are detained in maximum, maximum security detention. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of them are um, supposedly connected to um, gang-affiliated um, groups. Um, and we've seen that they have largely, it's been proven that they are not a part of those um, gang-affiliated groups, but they still remain in maximum security detention despite that um, for months. And so it further traumatizes those children. So my question um, for Mr. Miller is, excuse me, is um, uh, what is your guidelines for determining what child is a member of a gang? And also for Ms. Wong, if you've seen similar um, action happening in New York area. Thank you. Last two, Peter. Yeah, hi, I'm Peter. I'm with the Southeast Immigrant Freedom Initiative of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and we're a project doing pro bono representation for detainees in the Southeast. Uh, my question for Mr. Miller is if you could say, uh, what is current ICE policy in terms of setting bonds uh, before someone would see an IJ, um, and if that policy uh, does or should uh, vary across field offices. 
Peter. And a last question before our panelists respond. Thank you. Uh, Hassan Ahmed, I'm just an immigration lawyer. <laughs> hey, what do you mean just? just? Come on. No fancy titles here. Um, Mr. Rosenblum said that estimates, uh, in trying to determine whether the border is secure or not, everything is sort of an estimate game. It's hard to know the numbers, but that the border is harder than ever to cross uh, illegally than ever before. Then Mr. Miller says that still there's insufficient resources and we need programs like 287G. So my question is, is the border secure? If not, how will you tell when it is? And lastly, what role could immigration reform play in securing our border? Excellent. Well, they will have very short answers, 30 seconds <laughs> for each panelist. <laughs> Thank you. Great question, seriously. So uh, maybe the easiest thing to do is, I don't know, do we, you like to start, um, Cecilia, and then we'll just work our way down. I'm trying to give Phil a little rest, yeah. but yeah. then he'll only have four questions to deal with. I might with that to the detriment of, of our questioner because um, I, I think there was only one question addressed to me, which is the one about um, sending unaccompanied kids to secure facilities based on alleged gang affiliation. We have been following that. We have just filed a lawsuit on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I should say that. Uh, and bond. <laughs> <laughs> I too, I can't answer. <laughs> they have a bond lawsuit. So I apologize too. to our audience, uh, but hopefully we will get some official statement from, from ICE about that. The case is called Gomez versus Sessions. Uh, so your agency is, or department's not the first one on the list of defendants, uh, and that's filed in the, um, uh, I believe the Eastern District of California. There's also one. Sorry, southern Northern. It's in the Northern District of California. There's also one in the Southern District of New York. Okay, good. I'm glad I'm not the cause of your not being able to speak to the That's question. Okay. <laughs> Do you Mark? Want to say anything else? Or? That's it. Okay. Uh, so on the last question, um, uh, you know, the data that I described do tell us that the border is more secure, is harder to cross than it ever has been, more secure than it has been in terms of the number of people entering in at least 50 years. Uh, there is a legal standard in the secure, in uh, I think in the Secure Fence Act that, that defines operational security to be zero illegal entries. Uh, and, and the standard <laughs> put forth in the, Trump, in, in the Trump executive order on January 25th is operational control defined as zero illegal entries by that metric, the border's not secure. I mean, it's it's definitely not zero. Um, so you know, it's very much a political decision, or a pol you know, it's a, it's a policy decision, not a not an analytic decision. When the border is secure enough, um, but we are we are trying to come up with better tools to to be able to answer you know what we know about the state of security. But we're not going to decide when it's secure enough, um, or I'm not going to decide that in my current position. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and I'll also, uh, the question about Mexican deportations to, to Guatemala and the rest of the Northern Triangle. Um, uh, those numbers, so, so Mexico continues to deport about twice as many um, uh, children and families back to Central America as the U.S. does. I mean, that's a, a ballpark uh, number. Um, uh, MPI has done work on that. We look at those data uh, in, in my office as we're building you know, our estimates of, of sort of projections for what we expect to see. So. Um, you know, Mexico, um, both in coordination with the U.S. and in, you know, its own enforcement of its border and management of its immigration processes, uh, has a pretty robust uh, immigration enforcement effort um, that, that um, you know, definitely contributes to limiting the number of people arriving <laughs> here. Okay, so that's off. <laughs> I'm sorry, but because of the lawsuit on the detention. I, there's actually two. If you have one in the Northern District, there's also one in the Southern District <laughs> of New York, so that one's off the table. And ACU also has one in, is it the Southern District of California? On or the middle gang district? affiliation issue? No, on the, s the bonds. Is that in the Middle District? California. There's still yeah, one. There's, one there's, still, there's still one. Yeah. Uh, thanks. But um, like I said, if DOJ was here, but thanks for your position, I'm telling you mine. Um, so we'll go to courthouses. Um, just to reiterate, courthouses are not part of the sensitive location. So hope everyone's clear on that. Um, in terms of um, at or near schools, um, that's an individual assessment. Depending if that's where the person lives, you know, there's two choices, right? I mean, we can do at the person's residence, at the person's employment, or we can wait for them to go to a courthouse. I guess there's three. But um, generally, um, if, those, um, if those officers have the best information on, um, at the residence, 
then um, that would be the primary point of contact. If it's at their employment, it's at their, you know, that would be primary. It just depends on what information is available to the team when they go to make that at-large arrest. Um, you know, I mean, again, you know, from our perspective, if, if those counties were working more closely with us and allowing us to actually take custody of the person at the jail, that would take us out of the community. You may shake your head, but it's the fact, right? If, we, if they don't work with us at the jail, um, then, you know, it leaves us with doing at-large operations. Those individual assessments are made, you know, the team will basically put together for the field office director, um, and then she'll have to make an individual assessment if that's the most appropriate place to make contact. Um, the, the policy has and does provide for that. Um, in terms of the report on black immigrants being targeted more than other groups, I mean, <coughs> uh, I haven't seen that report, but I can tell you that we target based on criminality, and so, I don't think that's, you know, that's not limited to any one race over another if, you know, and we would have to actually see the information and Mark would have to look at it to see both the methodology and the data set because, uh, I, you know, uh, our top five countries are all from Mexico, Northern Triangle, and I think the Dominican Republic, right? So those are our top five for purposes of removal, although, um, you know, I don't know the top five for, for arrest, at-large arrests. Oh, for at large, I guess I'm not uh, sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, with the border, it's probably the same five. Uh, are you able to talk about the um, minors and maximum security? No, or is that that's, that's, that's a that's a no. gotcha. There's okay, there's Southern District, and now we. Oh, that I didn't know it was that case. Yeah. Great. Okay, well, um, first let me thank the audience. Um, lots of good questions. Uh, you, but I I think you got a lot of good questions because our panelists were excellent. I can't thank Phil. Mark and Cecilia, and us. so please join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs>